Awesome. Uh, so, uh, uh, I hope you guys can hear me. Yeah. So, uh, my name is Debashi, you know, and I'm going to talk about business intelligence and, and microservice architecture. To, I mean, so, uh, uh, Bull.com uh, is the company I work for, and it's, it's actually going through a transition right now, and we are moving towards microservices. So, I thought we, we, we are kind of doing some cool stuff. We, we think it's cool, but I thought we, I would share with you guys and let you guys decide. So, uh, what can you expect from this presentation? Uh, well, I, I'll give you a brief introduction about me and my company. Well, uh, and uh, it to run you through the history of, of business intelligence that's ha that, was, that was happening in Bull.com since the inception of the company. And, and we have, uh, in my opinion, there are like two eras happen that's going through uh, in, in Bull.com. One is the map reduce phase, and now it's more streaming and, and how we do BI with that kind of uh, stuff. It's fairly new, uh, fairly untested, but I thought I would share some insights and some operational stuff about how we manage our infrastructure. So about me, uh, so um, I'm Debashi. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Bull.com. Um, so, mm, I have twin responsibility at Bull.com, so I'm part of a, a big data platform team that's, uh, I'm responsible, uh, it's a DevOps team that, that builds tools and, and other kind of infrastructure stuff for Hadoop. And, and se secondly, I'm also part of a, a CA, CA, CEO uh, team which makes Google-related uh, Google optimizations and, and stuff like that. So, uh, uh, and about bull.com to give you a context. So it's it's an yeah. So so it's it's an e-commerce platform in Netherlands, fairly popular. Uh, well, so the the companies or uh, a company is one of the few uh, first implementations of Scrum in Netherlands, and we have over a thousand employees. Actually, over two hundred to three hundred employees in IT, and over forty Scrum teams. And it's fairly young. The average age is around 28, 32. So it's it's fairly, uh, and we have a mo motto that we bu you build, you run it, and you love it what you build. So uh, so and to give you an uh, idea how big the 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 size of the data is. So uh, these are some metrics about the actual functional data. But I mean, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the cluster, we have a fairly small cluster of twenty six nodes, and we have a weekly we have around uh, yeah, 90 unique jobs running. You know, monthly we have around 300 jobs, uh, around unique jobs running in, the, in our cluster. Um, so uh, it's, uh, our uh, nodes are really, uh, has really high capacity. So t t totally, the, it's around 1.5 petabytes of data that's available in, in our cluster. So that's pretty much about what, what's happening. So, but, Today's focus is about microservices and how you can do BI in it. It's, it's, uh, so before we go to the real topic, so what is microservice? I mean, uh, if you see this thing, this, this, this is uh, 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 called the Death Star architecture. It's, uh, yeah, uh, I hope there's, I'm assuming there's Star Wars fans here. Uh, sorry, yeah, so I mean, in the, uh, in the core of this Death Star is actually something called dependency hell. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's actually a thing. So this is I, I, it's really badly photoshopped, but I mean I picked it up from from a presentation. It's an actual thing. So what happens is in microservice, often you if you pick up any presentation, you of, often have a monolithic uh, app where you uh, which is probably Java or Ruby app, and then you have a database, and there's some magic happening, and you get some services out of it, which are like. Uh, so there is actually a science behind it. So you, I'm not really sure, but you find uh, you have dependencies and you try to figure out cohesion between the dependencies and then you decouple them together. But it, you b basically build services out of uh, your existing monolithic or probably new services or something. So that's that's pretty much what microservice is. I, well, just for the context. I mean, uh, and the second part of the. Uh, the presentation is about business intelligence. I'm, uh, for those who are fairly new in this uh, field, so business intelligence is about uh, analyzing data sets and collecting actionable items for your stakeholders. Uh, uh, 
Yeah, uh, uh, basically you, you want some KPIs or s for your stakeholders to understand how your business is doing, es essentially. So uh, some of the requirements that often an organization has is that all this data should be collected continuously and in an automatic fashion and often have different kind of data sources like flat files and XMLs and Excel sheets, internal databases, FTP, HTTP, various kind of sources. So, uh, and once you've collected them and you have transformed them, the, the analytics that you can do on this data set should be flexible. So these are often the requirements of an organization. To, uh, so it's, it's, business intelligence is not really a new field, to be honest. We already have techniques like ETL, uh, which extracts data uh, from, you know, which basically means extracting data from different sources. We have transformation layer, and you have, you, these architectures exist. Uh, and then you load it to a target data model. A target data model have something like Kimball's uh, data mo modeling techniques, like a star schema or snowflake schema, and uh, more advanced will be OLAP cubes, which are like derivative of, of star schema, to give you an idea about it. Uh, so uh, on my... Sorry, on my uh, left, yeah, left. Uh, you, this is more of a star schema. So the gran granularity of your data, which is the, the thing in the middle, is called fact, uh, which is the lowest, lowermost gran granular data, which, which has references to all these dimensional data. Uh, facts are, mu uh, are basically mutations, and you have dimensional data, which is the actual. When you combine them together, you get the actual uh, context of your data. And more advanced is basically uh, the cubes, uh, b which is basically you aggregate your uh, data for different dimensions. So you, you can actually drill down and drill in easily. And uh, in, if you have standard tooling, not standard tooling, but if you, have, if you bought, if you have, if you buy tools, so it has a different way of querying. So you use MDX to query o OLAP cubes. I'm not, I'm not the best person to give you an idea about this, but I mean, it's, it's a fairly open data. You can find it's been there for a long time. So it's kind of uh, the idea behind it. So in, in, our, in our monolithic days, uh, back in, I think, early, early around 2000 or something, we used to have this. So we had online. We, uh, so Bull.com is a web shop, so we had online systems. And if a marketing wants to make a campaign, the marketing person would actually query the online systems, make a report out of it, uh, doesn't matter, you know, uh, and then do stuff. But at one point, you know, it doesn't really work. It affects the actual web shop. Uh, at, at that point, they started thinking of actually decoupling your BI system. And, uh, well, they, at that point, they hired a lot of consultants and architects, and they came up with the architecture of uh, called... Uh, the data hub architecture, hub, hub and spoke architecture and BI. So you actually have a, a data is actually replicated to a data hub. Uh, uh, so you have a materialized view with, with a remote link to your online systems and you would refresh, uh, refresh your materialized view every 15 minutes or maybe daily, you know, it depends upon how often you want the data. And from the data, uh, the, the, that step is called replication. And from our uh, data hub to the data warehouse, you would have another materialized view that would sync your, uh, with the uh, data hub every 15 or, uh, minutes. So it depends on how often you want the data. That step is called replication, too. Uh, but, uh, and then you would, so once the data is, is uh, available in the data warehouse, you apply your ETL kind of logic, you know, and you would get your target uh, data model, which your end users would report on. Um, so it, the implementation was fairly easy. You would buy in some existing uh, propri proprietary stuff from some uh, user, uh, from, from some database provider. Uh, uh, the complexities are abstracted. You don't have to care about refreshing data, uh, really. I mean, and but then there are data overheads, and of course there's latency, uh, you know, because of the uh, refreshing happening across the systems. So, so some of the business guys said, I want data, I want it now. So, uh, so we, had, we still had the online systems. Uh, so, but then we had the, the message queues uh, in place. So the online systems would publish messages in the, in the broker and we would in the data side, we would have listeners which were written in stored procedures back in those days. 
2000, yeah. So uh, they would schedule the uh, listeners, and listeners would pull in data from from uh, message brokers. Uh, you know, uh, so the problem is, you know, if uh, well, in our case, uh, loss of messages because of the tooling that we used was not uh, was. Uh, uh, messages were guaranteed, but it, it, the thing is, you can have in this architecture, you can have lots of messages. Uh, it, uh, databases are not really kind of made for this directly, and uh, implementation is complicated. In fact, in certain places, they actually had uh, upsert for every message coming in on, on the target table, so that's an implement. It, it, if you don't understand what you're doing, it, you can end up making really bad software. Uh, uh, in, uh, and then you have an, a nightmare for operations, you know, uh, because if message broker goes down, you have a lot of different things uh, happening. So, so that's so the, the, that was okay, you know, but when when we moved towards microservices architecture, uh, the things just magnified, all the problems magnified, and. What we saw was there were too many, just too many sources to collect data from within the organization. All the internal sources exploded. Uh, it affects the stability of reports because you have too many dependencies to co data collect the data from. Um, and now what we had was we had a team of seven or eight people now who they had to do uh, collect data from 300 services, and it just the BI team doesn't scale as much, and then you have to, on top of that, you have to apply all these ETL log logic for most of the uh, data, and, and then you have service concatenation that you have to do, and it, it just is too much for, uh, 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 for a team of uh, few people. So at that point, we decided to move to Hadoop, because as the services were scaling, the data was growing, and uh, we had to do something about it. So at bold.com, we, we fairly have a, a good experience with Hadoop. We have been running it in production for 2010. We have been, uh, we know how, uh, th what things can go wrong and we know how to fix it. So we, some of the jobs like a commander was working, it's, it's really bad in terms of uh, the, uh, the amount of data it processes. So we know what kind of failures we can expect. And also in that point, we also started defining how a service looks like. So at this point, we made a decision of a conscious decision of, of uh, um, how we can make BI even easier, even though uh, uh, if we scale out from services things. So we defined how a service should look like. So a common thing in, in a service, uh, a microservice-oriented architecture is, is having RPC over HTTP, like a REST service or something. Uh, and, and the message queues. Uh, but uh, what we introduced was the idea of bulk interfaces. So uh, it is, it is the, the philosophy behind it is that you should be able to uh, transfer huge loads of data across services. Uh, so, uh, so think of a scenario where you have to do an initial load on, on some service. You, know, you, you don't really want to do that on, using HTTP. You, know, you should be able to do that directly to another way. So that's what uh, we decided to build. So bulk interfaces are, in our infrastructure, it's, it's basic, it's a philosophy, but in our infrastructure is basically an edge-based table. It's a key value uh, thing. So think about, think of it as, as uh, a, a key, uh, it's a key value uh, entity with, uh, with the key uh, composition consists of a time component in it, so and, uh, and the and a functional key component in it. So the time is 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 prepended. Yeah, uh, time is prepended to the functional key. Uh, and uh, when you replay all the events, because it has time, you know, and you can scan certain. Uh, you can have a sliding window in your data set, and if you replay all the events, you get the latest state of your uh, of your data essentially. So in this case, if you replay the time, times and you can actually get the state of different products, a, a latest state of different products. It's, it's also, it's, it's fairly inspired by event sourcing pattern. Uh, it's, it's a design pattern essentially, uh, which does something like this. And, and the key design is inspired by OpenTSDB. OpenTSDB has a similar key design, but it has a metric name in front of it, uh, something like that. So we, uh, we use this, uh, 
kind of principle, uh, the, the idea, uh, the second part is that the data here is kind of immutable, so you just prepend data. So in this way, you, uh, yeah, you, you can uh, collect, uh, yeah, it, it, if you have seen the presentation about uh, turning databases inside out, it talks about, it basically looks like a redo log in Oracle d databases or uh, MySQL bin in, in the uh, MySQL databases. If, uh, so, so that's the principle behind uh, bulk interfaces. So, uh, so once we have this, the source systems, this is the way services are going to share data with us. So we started thinking of how we can now uh, re think about uh, BI in, 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 in Hadoop. So, so, so these are the essential steps. So let's, let's assume we have three services. Uh, what, because we have the data in this fashion, we can do delta processing easily. So it's a, it's a key concept in, in, uh, in, in uh, uh, ETL. So you, you don't want to take the complete data set every time. And, and, uh, and process it. So you want to have a sliding window where you go from time T1 to T, uh, Tx, and you just want only that slice of the data. So, we, uh, so the way we get this data is via queues into the HBase tables. And then, uh, uh, so the services, and has a, has, there is a mapping layer called tooling, custom tooling within our infrastructure called Eddy. So it takes, uh, so, it, so all the services actually send an XML data or, or a JSON data. It can be any data format. And Eddy translates it into an insert statement in HBase and puts it. So teams do not have to deal with, uh, uh, with HBase directly. So uh, you can, if you are actually doing it, you can also use the REST service from, from HBase if you don't, do, not, do not want to deal with the, the internals of HBase as a team. So we insert the data into all the service and on all the service we have delta processing happening. And uh, so what we use is, is we, use, we have big scripts written uh, which, which do delta processing on, on these, da on these uh, HBase tables and uh, we have Big, this is fair, and, and then we have a scoop job which inserts data into our data warehouse in, into our models. All the transformations are happening there, and uh, actually, to be honest, uh, we do not do any transformations. So the whole idea of transformations are pushed back to the services because we are only storing the states. So uh, the, uh, the all the trans so we do not we all we do is we do delta processing on the data, collect them, aggregate them, and then push it back to data warehouse. So this is fairly. Uh, uh, common uh, architecture if you ask uh, uh, people who have been doing data warehouse in Hadoop. But there is a problem here, right? I mean, uh, the problem is uh, at, at the scoop end, uh, that's a bottleneck. Uh, if, if you want to move towards more self-service BI, uh, it's, it's, it, it's fairly difficult to do that in kind of this kind of scenario. Uh, so yeah, so we have a tooling, so we have run deck for scheduling these jobs. Uh, we have Conical for the database side, yeah. So, uh, so, so before, I, uh, so first of all, there are two problems here. There's one is basically the bottleneck that can happen at the scoop end because of it, it's going to a single a monolith data data warehouse. And the second part is that uh, you have to write big scripts for all these uh, 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 all these uh, services that you have to collect data from. So first, we try to solve that. Uh, basically, what we did was we tried to reinvent a, a BI integration unit. So uh, the thing is, once you t uh, push the transformation to the services, all you have to do is uh, do a very dumb thing where you have to take the events and replay all the events and just push the data. So I mean, this is a very common pattern across all the all the uh, uh, services. So we we thought we can actually. Uh, Automate this thing. You know, we shouldn't be writing pick scripts for all the all the services. So what we did was we thought, what are the use cases? What are the things that we need? One is uh, we need an aggregation job for every service, and we need uh, a way to concatenate all the services. So uh, on on one or many uh, keys. So we wrote uh, we, uh, because I purely do not have uh, 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 the devs uh, ops background, but we. It took an inspiration from Puppet. So this is basically a puppetized way of adding a service into the whole infrastructure. So we, we have an HBase table. We map it to an Oracle table. And what this script essentially does, we have a tooling called, uh, which actually generates a pick script 
all the, all the uh, monitoring around it and, and, and scoop script and it, it pushes data to the, the warehouse. So you basically also have types from, from, uh, uh, that's required. So if, if something fails, it gets notified uh, and, and, and things like that. So in this way, it's pretty tightly uh, chained with the whole infrastructure. It also gets scheduled. Uh, so you can also specify the schedule that you want. And, and so that's, that's one thing. You know? We did not, did not want to collect data from every service. Uh, but big them, so we started generating them. So you would just plug your service into the data warehouse like this. Um, but then we still have uh, now we have two problems. One is is the bottleneck. Yes. The second one is that everything is batch. Uh, so there is still latency. You know, uh, there is still a certain amount of latency because MapReduce, for example, is optimized for high throughput. So every time you run the job, it's it it takes a lot of uh, it takes certain amount of containers uh, in in our cluster, uh, and and it depends upon the how much data you have. Yeah, but still, it, you it, it's a, it's optimized for high throughput. You don't want to do that every uh, every 15 minutes or every two minutes. On on or you you can how small can you make your batch? No, so that's that's the problem. Uh, it's batch uh, thing, and then. You have all these pipelines. It takes time to get the data into the report. Uh, and since we are in in, in e-commerce platform, we we really want to be on top of the uh, uh, of the curve. We, we really want to be have the data and analysis right away. Uh, so we uh, so we realized that actually data is asynchronous. Every data is is, is almost every sources that we had in our system. Uh, are as asynchronous, clicks are asynchronous, orders are asynchronous, offers are asynchronous. So, in fact, a batch is, is actually a stream, you know? Uh, so, it's a stream is essentially you have a point, start point, and you have your end point is infinity, and a batch is more of a bounded stream. So, uh, so we uh, decided to move to the streaming era, you know, with Flink, and uh, with Flink, what we had was uh, the entry uh, of b um, barrier is low. Your code is, is smaller, and, and you have really nice Java functional APIs to do that. And we kind of have a f operational experience now we, because we have been trying it out a lot. So we decided to actually experiment with our things. But one thing that we realized is that you don't really need queues for streaming, or, or you don't always need a queues for, queues for streaming. You can use... Uh, actually, you can use edge-based tables for streaming too. You know, it's stream. You can make streams out of files too. Uh, so what we uh, started thinking was, so let's say we have a given because we have this event source pattern. So let's say we have uh, a start time, and then you can with edge-based you can actually ask for give me next x records. You no, know? it can be hundred, it can be few thousand. So you can ask for and with what if with while true give me x records you keep getting a, a small batches of of uh, records back and you, in this way you can build a stream out of it uh, the, the other way to do that is basically you say you give a start to an end or to to your so uh, you know in your sourcing component and you can ask for give me uh, start time and time give me all the records from this uh, thing so in this way you can actually stream your edge based tables all of a sudden so so let's take an example. For example, we have uh, uh, offers and we have product a, a catalog. So you want to see, uh, let's say, for product category X, how many offers are there? Or what is the best offer for this product with some description? So what you would do is, uh, for a given product ID, uh, you would start streaming them. So because the, both the streams are independent of each other, uh, so offers is calculating best offer for this product ID, while product category is is kind of uh, slow uh, uh, because it's a lot of data. So it it eventually enters and on the on the we have a a sync where we have uh, the table has key as product ID and everything else. So it it looks like a star schema. Uh, so you can add more things with product ID as key. So it kind of becomes like a star schema, and, and uh, it's an edge-based table. 
and you apply Platfora, which is our, our new tooling that we are using for self-service BI on, on Edgebase. So it kind of, uh, you can actually start using this star on Platfora right away. So we have been uh, thinking how we can automate this and what we ended up do building is, is a, a wrapper around uh, Flink. So you can actually say from this table on certain global key, you can, and you can look up while you're streaming and you sync to certain uh, multiple tables. So that's, uh, that's one of the things that we did. And, f and finally, uh, we have been, because Flink is a streaming application, it, we do not deploy it uh, like Hadoop. So what we do is we, uh, in our uh, Maven, we have built a Maven uh, project, where, which it builds into a Docker image, and we push it to a, a Docker registry, and while uh, deploying, it pulls in the Docker, the latest, or uh, the version of Docker image. We tag it with the, the version number, and it pulls it and pushes it to uh, uh, Mesos, and starts uh, the Flink client on, on Mesos, and submits the job in, uh, in Hadoop Yarn. And yeah, so one thing that we actually learned uh, was uh, basically you do need a dedicated team for doing innovations of these sorts because uh, it, it, it takes, uh, for individuals, scrum teams is too much to do these things. And the one thing you have to think about is, is not tools, but how to solve problems. It, it's, it's kind of a hipster way of solving BI problem. Uh, uh, but uh, the other thing that we, uh, uh, so was Flink can be flinky because uh, we you have to figure out a lot of things yourself and and there are a lot of issues. Uh, well, if you have uh, attended Neil's presentation, there's an issue with Scrubgrass ticket and and stuff. And there are a lot of frameworks out there. And and when we started doing this BI thing on Hadoop, uh, we did, there was uh, there was no Kylin back in those days around 2013 2014. So Kylin is is actually a new uh, uh, project. Uh, which, which I think is, is if you are going to start with it, you should l definitely look at it. And, and yeah, and also like a lot of uh, BI and, and Hadoop developers don't think about infrastructure. They take it for guarantee. I mean, I would say respect the infrastructure uh, for Hadoop. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, we do have time for questions. Um, does anybody have any um, um, burning question? Um, could you give me a sense of like the, so you said like in the beginning, the problem is that you have batches and the batches can yeah. be very large, right? Yeah. So there is a big delay proportionally. So um, just just like orders of magnitude, like how much did you manage to like improve this delay? Like how much quick, because the pipeline seems a lot more complicated, yeah. um, but is it is it like, at which point is it worth it? That's I mean, basically. which delay you're talking about? I mean. Okay. Um, well, you said in the beginning that yeah. like from your, from your offer or from your application to the data warehouse, there were like two batch yeah, steps, yeah, yeah. which take a long time, but now you kind of removed them. So, so like how much quicker is the data flowing through uh, now? So uh, uh, for example, like uh, in previously, it, it previously before I joined the team, there were certain jobs that did self join with themselves and to calculate the best offers and they were really bad. No, some some of the times, if the offers would do an initial load, they would take a day to process, and and with these, it's it's it would definitely finish within an hour or something. Okay. So. Hello. Yeah. Uh, I would like to ask, how did you manage the dependency while moving to microservices? W what? Dependency with with other so part of the system. Yes. Uh, uh, I mean, we haven't moved completely, and, and that's always a discussion. It's a, actually an organizational problem than uh, the thing. So, I mean, the way they, they do it is you look at the, the common dependencies together, and you try to make a service out of it so that it becomes an independent deployable unit on, 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 on your infrastructure. But, I mean, it's, it's always a discussion. I mean, what is, uh, how do you take, 
it out of that. So that if, I don't know if that answered your question. So so that's that's how we do it. Now we try to figure out how we can independently deploy a certain part of application. For example, you have checkout or, or fulfillment or something. So what are the, the services required for for certain things, and you deploy it that way. So that you can continuously deploy the application. So. Are you using it in production for historical data or just for, for kind of very recent data, like one month? Yeah, uh, we have historical data. Okay, uh, so if you are using it for historical data, how yeah. do you handle uh, late arriving facts and late arriving so, dimensions? So it eventually becomes consistent in, in if you look at the edge base kind of with the Flink uh, in, uh, architecture, it eventually becomes consistent. So. Uh, so that's that's how we solve it. I don't know if that answered your question. Uh, yes, it does. So it means that at the point you have to fully reprocess the entire data. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, you're using Mesos in one of the last yeah, slides. Yeah. Uh, on which scale for some services or generally? So. Uh, uh, I'm I'm not sure if, if I can give you a complete uh, idea, but I mean, I think it's around, it's, we are going to production with Mesos soon. So, and the scale is around, it's a small scale, I think around five to 10 machines. Okay. And, but I mean, uh, we have, uh, it's gonna be part of our, of our core infrastructure. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Let's uh, th thank uh, the speaker again.